You know, the lyrics of that song that we just heard are really true, aren't they? Fear is a liar. It would it, it have us believe so many things that just are not true. And uh, sometimes those battles that take place inside of us, they could be oblivious to the people that are around us of really what's going on. But internally, there is this stress, there's just so much anxiety. These days could just kind of fan that into flame. It's the reason why we need to focus, right? We need to think God's thoughts after him. We need to take the revelation that God has given of himself and of the world and begin to just absorb that. Because within us then, that becomes strength. You know, when it says to cast all your, you know, um, all your anxiety upon him, God makes a promise. He says that he will give you a peace that passes all understanding. But peace isn't just something passive. No, no, peace, the peace of God is something robust because it says it will stand as a guard to your heart and to your mind. Let, let, your, let your mind begin to dwell on things that are untrue and you can begin to feel how this kind of like whirlwind begins, and the next thing you know, you find yourself going deeper and deeper and deeper into this darkness, and the next thing you know, your heart follows, and God's saying, no, 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 see, when you cast all your anxiety upon me, I promise to give you a peace that will guard your heart and your mind. But it's because we know who God is, that he's already made a declaration, a declaration that he would never leave us or forsake us, that if we call upon him, that he will answer. When we cry, he will say, here I am. I, I, I want to have us look today at another passage that uh, concludes our study in the book of Isaiah. One of the things that we've learned is, as a result of this strength that we receive from him, it, it's so that we may be able to participate in God's divine nature. So that what it means to be a son or a daughter of God, it means that I can actually walk in that. That there is this light that is now beginning to illumine my steps and I can take confidence in the way in which I approach the crises as well as the successes. I, I become a much more measured person because I know what God has in store for me. So the result of this strength and power is that not only I participate in the divine nature, but there's something else too. It says that I can escape the corruption that is in the world caused by evil desire. Misplaced affections, our, our, our desires that are pretty much self-centered, those are the things that sometimes can get us into trouble. Those evil desires really have taken center stage in the book of Isaiah. The, the prophet Isaiah took us on a journey through some of Israel's darkest times. The world Isaiah addressed was compromised or, or comprised of the cities of Manville and Zion. I named them that because the cities of Manville was all about man. The city of Zion it was a city of God. Only in Isaiah's day, those living in Manville, they were just living by their own rules. Not everyone living in Manville fared the same, though. While some thrived, it was often at the expense of those who had limited resources. The city of Manville projected an image of freedom and prosperity and unlimited success. Yet in reality, it was a city that fostered a self-centered attitude rife with acts of injustice. Some, true, lived walled off from the rest, enjoying a false sense of security, while others lived out their days guarded in want and feeling defeated. Many citizens in Manville grieved over the conditions of their various neighborhoods. And yet in Zion, the city seemed to have lost much of its luster and was becoming desolate. In Zion, 
Too many had been lured away by the false promises of Manville, no longer content to live in Zion. And those who remained as citizens of Zion were ostracized by the residents of Manville. Zion was seen as backward, without sophistication. The ideals of Zion, they no longer seemed to um, resonate with the people. You know what those ideals were, right? In the city of God, they were captured in the Ten Commandments that were now mocked and dismissed. You remember what those Ten Commandments were? It starts out, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven image. It says, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain, that you need to remember the Sabbath, that you need to honor your father and mother, that you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't bear false witness, and you shouldn't covet. See, all of these commandments, people disregarded, and in their places, they erected their own standards of righteousness. But Isaiah told us then that in the midst of the struggle between Manville and Zion, the city of God, all of a sudden now, a war was about to break out. The constant animosity between the rival cities of Manville and Zion now had to contend with a new enemy. The nations surrounding them were about to launch a war. Manville's security no longer seemed so ironclad. Alliances were sought, but the consequences of their decisions had disastrous ramifications. The result were cities were overrun, lives were lost, people were exiled, the land was scorched, and in its place he just left what resembled a burned stump. And why? I want you to pay close attention to this one, because this is what the whole book of Isaiah has really been leading to. We have spent a number of months working our way through this book of Isaiah. We should know the answer to this by now. Why did all of this happen? Why did this fall on Zion and Manville? Well, it was because the heart of God's chosen people were, was far from him. Their actions gave voice to the true desires of their hearts. They had forgotten the covenant that God had established with Moses years before. You know what that was, right? God said this to Moses. He says, now I want you to talk to my people. I want you to tell them this, that now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. You see, they were to be a people through whom the world would be blessed. And instead, they provoked the Lord's judgment. And judgment came through the nations of Assyria and Babylon, where they were forced from their land, their cities were plundered, and their people were killed or forced into exile. These were very harsh days in Isaiah's time. And so throughout, so throughout this entire book of Isaiah, we have seen something about the heart of God. We have seen how he hates iniquity, and he has promised to judge sin. Yet he is also merciful, and he promises us his servant, Emmanuel, a child would be born, a son would be given, the government would be upon his shoulders. And it's through him that he would rescue his remnant who now appeared as that dead stump. So that once again, and we read these words in the New Testament in 1 Peter, 
Once again, God would establish a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God so that we might declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, that's always been God's intention, to draw the people from Manville back into the city of God. So now we've come to the end of the book of Isaiah, and here we're about to read about God's final decree. What is this final word that God is going to speak through his prophet? What are these words which have echoed through the preceding generations to our present day? What are we to glean from these historical events that brought down such a mighty nation? What are we to ponder as we make our way through life in these days? I want you to think about that today as we just for a moment reflect upon God's final decree. It's found in the last two chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. One of the things that you're going to see that makes up God's final decree is how he has been provoked to judgment. Listen to these words. He says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. To a nation that did not call on my name, I said, here am I, here am I. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. You see why I talk about this city of Manville? Because here is a city, they're not looking for God, they're not seeking him out. In their obstinance, they just pursue their own way, a way that from God's perspective, he says, is not good. It's just a pursuit of their own imagination. But he goes on and he talks about what that really looks like. In verse 3 of Isaiah 65, he says this, Your people who continually provoke me to my very face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on altars of brick, who sit among the graves and spend their nights keeping secret vigil, who eat the flesh of pigs and whose pots hold broth of unclean meat, who say, keep away, don't come near me, for I am too sacred for you. See, this is sometimes when you read your Bibles and you come to a passage like this, it just seems to be speaking about such a different culture, doesn't it? So far removed from where we are today. But what God is basically saying in this passage is that he has revealed his will and way to his people. And instead, they have gone off in pursuit of other gods. They have made idols for themselves and bowed down to those. And the things that God had said ought to circumscribe them as a people, they have completely done away and thereby have rejected not only God's counsel, but God himself. Let me take you to this other text in verse 11. God says, but as for you who forsake the Lord and forget my holy mountain, who spread a table for fortune and fill bowls of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword, and you will all bend down for the slaughter. For I called, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not listen. You did evil in my sight and chose what displeases me. You see, they replaced God with their idols. In action, they forsook, and in their minds, they forgot. I like the way Alex Moyer, a uh, New Testament theologian and uh, uh, also an author on the book of Isaiah, he wrote this. He says, religion is no substitute for personal relationship. They found no difficulty being religious 
In fact, they would climb any mountain except the one where they might, they might meet the holy God. You see, in our text, it says, spread a table for fortune and fill bowls mixed with wine for destiny. He writes, this is just an exposure of the silliness of false religion. Imagine this. Gods that need to be wined and dined and are yet thought to be the controllers of destiny. You see, fortune in your text is a reference to the Syrian God who was worshiped widely in Isaiah's day. Destiny was also a God that seemed to have control over the future. So let's, let's give them wine. Let's spread out a table before them so that we can win them over as if they were human like you and me and we can just coerce them into doing our will and our bidding. But that's not how it works. You see, when you look at the text, God said he had made himself known. They didn't have to try to coerce God. They didn't have to try to butter him up. It was nothing like the false gods that they were worshiping. God says, listen, I called. But you just didn't listen. I spoke. You turned the other way. You, you did evil in my sight. You chose what displeased me. Do you see in, in, in this text that what God is really disclosing here is says, when I called, what God's saying is, you didn't have to figure out what my will was because I told you, I made it known. And I spoke, so whatever was in my mind, you could understand. And you should have no problem understanding something about my nature because I do not delight in evil. And you should have known something about my heart because you spent all your time running in ways that just displeased me. You see, at the heart of what was provoking this judgment was a people who had just run after their own imaginations and left God off in the distance. And now they are going to be paid back. Notice what he says here. He says, such people are smoke in my nostrils of fire that keeps burning all day. See, it stands written before me, I will not keep silent, but will pay back in full. I will pay it back into their laps, both your sins and the sins of your fathers, says the Lord, because, why, they burn sacrifices on mountains and defiled me on the hills. You see, what he's referencing again are these, is this idol worship. And what was behind all of that? But trying to secure a, a better life? Trying to um, appease a God so that their ways would be smooth? More successful? All of the things that God had promised to his people if they just set their hearts and minds on him. But instead, they'd rather bow down to a God named fortune or destiny. And despite all of the prophets that God sent and all of the revelation that he had given, it had reached such a point that God says, you are so far removed from me. And he brought down the nations from the north, the Babylonians, and they were instruments of justice. But you know what? God is also, in this final decree, telling us, not that he's just provoked to judgment, but that he says, I'm going to preserve a remnant. Because in the midst of this, I don't want you to think that I've forgotten you. God's judgment is going to be measured. He's looking for this remnant to be preserved. Listen to what he says here in verse 8. He says, this is what the Lord says. As when juice is still found in a cluster of grapes, and men say, don't destroy it, there is yet some good in it. So will I do in behalf of my servants. 
I will not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob, from Judah, those who possess my mountain. My chosen people will inherit them, and there will my servants live. And then listen here in verse 10. He says, Sharon will become a pasture for flocks, the valley of Achor, a resting place for herds, for my people who seek me. Let me give you an example of what God is really saying in this, in this verse. I want to give you a look at a map. And you see from Joppa going upward all along that coastal region, it was known as the Plain of Sharon. You see where the, the Dead Sea, a, a, a little bit above the Dead Sea is where you find Jericho, and right just a few miles outside of Jericho was what was known as the Valley of Achor. It was very rough terrain. What God's saying is, from all the way over to the Dead Sea, this promised land that I had given to you, all the way over to the Mediterranean Sea, he says, I'm going to take the valley of pain and trouble, and instead, what does he say here? There is going to be a resting place for my people who seek me. The plains of Sharon, they were utterly destroyed when the Babylonians came down. All of this territory that you see on this map right now was completely taken over by the Babylonians. And they would destroy the city of Jerusalem and its temple. All these people would be displaced, exiled if they were not killed. And so now you're looking at these places that were just devastated. But God is saying, no, 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 I, I am doing a work here. I'm going to preserve a remnant. I'm going to bring them back. This is going to be a place where they can go and pasture their flocks, a place where they can find rest. See, because God, he knows the end from the beginning. What he's telling them ultimately is, I am going to redeem my people, and there they will rebuild, and there they will be restored. But ultimately, you know what God's game is? In the final decree that God gives us, he speaks not only of judgment and not only of a rescue, but he speaks of a new creation. Tell me if these words don't sound familiar to you. These words are echoed in the last book of the New Testament in the book of Revelation. But they were uttered centuries before through the prophet Isaiah. God says, behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to an end. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered cursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people." My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear, or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. He says, the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. 
they will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain. See, in God's final decree, he opens wide the curtains and says, ultimately what he is working on is a new creation. A place where there is everything made new. Where this mortality will take on immortality. Where all of creation, it says, will be at peace within itself. Those are the references to the wolf and to the lamb laying down and feeding together. Our very natures are going to be changed and we're going to see God for who he truly is. So let me wrap this up for you. God's final decree is all about sin that will be punished. Evil is going to be addressed. God is going to rescue his people. And a new creation is going to be in store. But now I want to get personal for a moment. Idols played a major part in the world of Isaiah. And I want you to understand something. Idols play a major role in the world today. Dr. Tim Keller wrote a fascinating book called Counterfeit Gods. You ought to just Google that and um, you could download it. It's a great read and he gives you a whole list of the kinds of gods that we contend with, counterfeit gods in the days in which we're living, idols that man has made up for himself. Tim Keller was a pastor of Redeemer Church in the heart of New York City. I think he can speak with deep insight into the current culture that we find ourselves. But why do I say idols play such a big role? I read uh, an article by Eric Geiger, a great theologian. I just want to ask you to just think through some of these words with me. He makes reference to Martin Luther. He said, Martin Luther believed that every violation of the Ten Commandments, we referred to those earlier, right? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The very first commandment. Luther believed that every violation of the, of the Ten Commandments was first a violation of the first commandment, putting another God besides God in my life. So if I give a false witness, it's because I have said something else in my heart above God that is worth lying for. And if I steal, it is because I have first set up something else in my life that is cherished above him. Or put it succinctly, under every behavioral sin is the sin of idolatry. Can I talk about four of those powerful kinds of idols that we have very prevalent in our society today? How about the idol of power? A longing for influence and recognition? Or how about control? A longing to have everything go according to my plan. You heard it today in the testimony of those who were leading worship, right? It, it became startling how so much of what we thought we had control in, now God is asking us to open up that hand. How about comfort? Comfort could become an idol where we just long for the pleasures of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. For some, we hold as an idol approval, a longing to be accepted or desired. The theologian John Calvin stated, the evil in our desire typically does not lie in what we want, but that we want it too much. See, it's not, it's not making it an idol to want a good job and, um, and make more money. 
But how about if the reason why I want that job and I want to make more money is because I think that if I had that job and make more money, then people would really respect me and, and that becomes the drive. Or I just want all that money so that I can just really feed into my own appetites and find that little by little I have neglected more and more of God's call on my life. I had that conversation recently with one of my kids when I just sat down and talked to them about their money. And I said, how generous are you with your money? How open are you are to the fact that God says, I have given you all of these blessings. And I reminded them again, do you recognize that in the Bible, God says, why do you rob me? You see, if we're not careful... We can allow these idols of power and control and comfort and approval to so dictate the, courses of, the course of our life that the next thing you know, God is put out on hold. And we're no longer thinking his thoughts after him. We're no longer trying to understand something about the heart of God. No, it's only about making my life better, my life easier, my life more powerful. Has we, have we learned nothing else from this particular crisis that we're living through? Do we not feel so vulnerable at this moment? I remember reading an article just recently, one of our warships that had nuclear warheads or anything, about 300 sailors came down with the COVID virus. And now this a ship that could simultaneously destroy many of the cities that we live in in this world, all of a sudden now is scampering around to find out how are we going to get these 1,200 sailors off? How are, what are we going to do with the ship? We, we still got to maintain some kind of presence here. And it just turned them upside down. A flu takes a mighty vessel that can destroy huge parts of a world. or a whole world now turned upside down, an economy turning itself all over the place? What happens to power and control? What happens to our comfort and the sense of approval? A little virus comes, and the next thing you know, your whole world is upside down, revealing sometimes where it is that we have put our hope. What truly is our refuge? So how do you overcome that? How do we keep ourselves from these idols? Thomas Chalmers, he wrote, he says, the best way to overcome the world is not with morality or self-discipline. It's not about just trying harder. Listen to this, because this is the heart, I think, of Isaiah and the heart of the whole word of God. Christians overcome the world by seeing the beauty and excellence of God's rescuer. They overcome the world by seeing something more attractive than the world itself. And that's Jesus. Do you see in Jesus something more attractive than the idols of this world? Or, we hold on, or do we hold on to them so tenaciously that we lose sight? It's kind of like when you have two little kids and or, you know, they're, they're brothers, right? And one's maybe four or five years older than the other one. The other one's maybe about three and the other one's now about eight. And he convinces him that he should give him his dime because his nickel is bigger. The devil's always trying to do that trade. But he's a liar. You want to remove the idols from your life, it's not just by willpower. Otherwise, you could do it yourself. No, it's by setting your affections on things above. It's about having your mind renewed so that you see the excellencies of God far outweigh 
all that the world has to offer. You see, our current crisis is striking at the heart of these four pillars of power and control and comfort and approval. But we must never replace our dependence upon God who has demonstrated that his power is greater. His control is perfect. His comfort is satisfying and his approval is eternal. There is no God like our God. <laughs> if you have any doubt, just remember what he can do with a dead stump. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for just the reality that you have shared with us in this prophetic book of Isaiah. Reminded again, Lord, something about the sincerity of your own heart and your desire for a people to thrive and flourish. How it grieves you, Lord, when we have misplaced our affections and we have allowed our imaginations to just take us to places that just undo one's life. Help us to learn to build on the sure foundation of Jesus, of his righteousness. Help us to learn what it means to run with endurance this race of faith. Help us, Lord, to gain such a picture of Jesus that we see him as Lord of all. I thank you, Lord, for this righteous branch that has provided shelter and refuge for us all. And as always, Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. You are alive. 
with the heart, doesn't it? Because our heart, it can be drawn in so many other, you know, in so many other directions. That single-mindedness that God is asking us to give to him so that it would inform all of our other ambitions and aspirations. It's a way of making sure that we don't lose sight of the goal It's making certain that now we have all the provision that God has so that we might live life with abundance. Come on, we've all had that experience, right? Of compromising in ways that we thought in the moment would just enhance my life. But now, in retrospect, we look back and we realize it really was robbing me of life. It stole something from me. Can't you see that throughout the the scriptures, it's a story over and over again of God who is trying to wean his people from the things of this world so that they may lay hold of a world to come. There is nothing in all of creation that could ever separate you from the love of Jesus. And that includes a coronavirus. And one thing is certain, that our days in this world will one day result in us standing before a holy God. In those moments, you want to be a part of that remnant. You want to be a part of the redeemed, for they will inherit something that they could never think or imagine. This crisis has just taken a light and it has caused us to think a little bit more deeply about these these pillars of 
power and control and comfort and acceptance. All things that God says in him. We can just fan those into flame because he gives us a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. So you go out today. You leave our time together with the assurance that God is good. All the time. <laughs> and all the time, God is good. God bless you.